Thanks for the introduction. I want to I'll, uh, make this short and sweet. Um, yeah, here to you to talk uh, a little bit about um, one of the topics I'm fairly passionate about, and uh, we will be talking about it a little bit later um, in the day as well at a, um, a talk that our developer advocate Gibbs uh, from Chronosphere is giving. Uh, my name is Rob. I'm the uh, creator of the M3DB open source project um, and the, the CTO of Chronosphere, which is a hosted SaaS uh, observability um, and Prometheus native um, monitoring platform. Uh, so this is something that I assume uh, lots of us have faced, um, loading up a dashboard or trying to essentially view some high, uh, high cardinality latency data over a um, growing set of pods or uh, d distributed system that you're monitoring. And, um, you know, of course, uh, over time, this can become um, something that can, uh, you know, w when you add a whole bunch of cardinality really quickly become uh, an immediate problem that impacts your visibility. So hands up who's ever run into this kind of situation unexpectedly. Wonderful, I'm not the only one. <laughs> um, so this talk, the title of it uh, definitely seems, um, I guess, uh, perhaps a little bit, uh, a little bit um, uh, extensive, like millions of time series. You know, why are we talking about millions of time series here? Uh, most of the pods that we're monitoring are in the hundreds. Um, but, uh, you know, I just wanted to kind of paint a picture of how you actually get to millions of time series while monitoring these pods um, in, in a cloud native world that uh, may be unexpected to the average. Um, uh, to, to, to the average developer when they start, you know, deploying um, applications and, and monitoring systems in, in a container world. So I'm just talking here about a single metric, and we'll find very quickly that just measuring HTTP or GP, uh, sorry, or gRPC traffic um, can become uh, quite high cardinality very quickly. So we're talking about 50 microservices, 200, say, average pods per service. Now that seems large, but imagine, you know, even pegging one of these numbers down and you can, you're still in a very um, high cardinality world. Um, and then say, uh, you know, each one of these services might have 20 average, um, on average, HTTP endpoints or gRPC methods, five common status codes, and 30 histogram buckets. Um, so you, you quickly get to 30 million unique time series, which is um, insane. This is a single metric we're talking about here. Uh, and you have lots of things you're tracking and lots of unique metric names uh, in an organization. Um, so wouldn't it be nice as well to slice and dice by the Git server version or the mobile client app version or web front end version? Uh, these are all things that are just really obtuse uh, when you get to these kind of numbers of unique time series. So you know, if you multiply by two twice, you get to 120 million time series, again, for a single metric. Um, if we remove the pod cardinality, this becomes much more manageable. We get down to 150,000 unique time series across all 50 microservices. Um, and then, you know, it becomes uh, manageable in terms of how you think about keeping these around for a long time. So, um, you know, if you multiply by twice again um, each time to get the serv active server versions and the mobile client versions on there, you're, you're with below 1 million unique time series. Um, so how to get there? Uh, a lot of folks, you know, already like recognize this problem and deploy um, uh, best practices to uh, make dashboards faster, alerts more manageable, um, and keeping this data around for longer periods of time more possible um, uh, using recording rules. And recording rules are uh, one of you know the uh, unarguably very powerful tools in the Prometheus um, toolset. Uh, however, at these types of uh, cardinality, they, you do run into frequent problems trying to deploy them um, in some of these you know, single individual metric, uh, metrics that you're tracking that are very high cardinality. So we're talking here about deploying a rule that actually handles the latency for across all 50 services, just as an example up front. Um, one thing you might run into when deploying this rule is that you'll find that the Prometheus instance or uh, remote storage um, solution that you're using, such as Thanos, Cortex, or M3, 
uh, starts basically unable to um, even evaluate that result because it's touching 30 million time series. Um, and uh, you'll see, you know, Prometheus rule evaluation errors uh, in your metrics that, that, you're, that you're monitoring for um, your monitoring platform. <clears throat> and then, you know, you go look in the logs, you'll, you might see something like query processing would load too many samples um, in the memory. Uh, so that's the first um, issue you might face. Another issue is if you reconfigure your Prometheus or your remote storage instance to actually um, allow you to bypass those limits, you'll see that very frequently when we're talking about 30 million time series, you're gonna start missing that evaluation cycle. Um, it, it takes far too long to uh, load all of that into memory, process that out, and record all the um, results uh, when you've got that kind of level of cardinality for a single rule. Um, and then if, you know, there, there's, um, of course, the workarounds that you might deploy. So you might deploy, so I already mentioned one, which is raising the maximum samples um, per query allowed by Prometheus or your remote storage. Um, the problem with that is that you'll probably run out of memory. Uh, we're talking about 30 million time series, um, and especially if you, you know, want to do some kind of SLA calculation that actually is pulling back historical data, not in the the recent like 30 minutes, 30 minute window. Um, that, that's just a lot of data to load and process into the query engine um, just by itself. Uh, and then, you know, if you're able to deploy enough resources and um, uh, bypass the, the max samples limit, um, you're, you, by a config, you're still gonna see that you may miss the, uh, the interval. So, you know, you might go and split out the rules, one per service. Um, but this, again, has similar problems. Uh, so, you know, divide 30 million by 50, get each rule taking about 600, uh, each rule needs to process 600,000 unique time series still, um, which is, you know, qu quite, a, quite a huge number. You, you're gonna eventually hit the, the timeouts um, uh, per uh, rule group for, for that kind of um, deployment. And also just, at the end of the day, you're using a lot of resources just to uh, you know, basically aggregate uh, things in the same system that's storing your data. So architecturally, you know, these are the steps that happen. So you collect the metrics, um, you write them to disk, uh, and then the, when you evaluate the recording rule, it does an, uh, a reverse index query, and then if it's touching millions of time series or very high cardinality, it, that um, can be expensive memory-wise memory, memory wise, uh, in of itself. You read from that storage, you evaluate the results, then you write it back to storage. Um, and so that's, you know, on a single node, that, that, um, that you can actually get quite far because there's levels of efficiency with everything happening in a single process here. Um, once you go to a distributed model uh, with, you know, Thanos Cortex, M3, any, anything else, um, this picture looks even more expensive because not only are you doing that frequent, expensive reverse index query, reading from storage, evaluating and writing back, this is all going across the network. Uh, so you know, every 15, 30 seconds, 60 seconds, whatever your uh, valuation interval is, you're, you're pulling back huge amounts of data over the network from many nodes, coordinating into one place where you need to reserve a lot of resources and then um, all write it back and serialize that um, as, as RPC or HTTP calls. Um, M3 aggregation is a little bit different. So it's not meant to be a replacement for recording rules, but it can turn a lot of distinct counters into fewer aggregate counters. Um, and uh, it does that by basically taking, you know, it can do things like take the derivative as the first function of each time series and then aggregate that together um, and then build another monotonic counter uh, from, from input counters. So what it's doing is as data is written to either the N3 coordinator, uh, which can be used as a sidecar next to Prometheus, or using a scaled up M3 aggregator instance, um, it, it essentially does those uh, multi-step aggregations, and it, it, at each step, it basically can do a hop within um, the cluster itself, so it can spread that load for really high Cardinelli workloads over multiple nodes. And then this is all happening in memory, and then eventually it writes the um, results of storage. Uh, and you, we can do this now uh, with M3 as of v1.3 with any uh, Prometheus remote write the receiver. So this is not just an M3DB feature. You can combine this feature with any other uh, remote write backend. Um, 
And so, you know, it's really meant to be a supplement to recording rules. Uh, it saves the frequent expensive step um, of the reverse index query, the read from storage, only to write back. Um, it, you can scale aggregation separate to your TSDB, so you allow your TSDB to focus on executing alerts and dashboards. Um, and you, you can aggregate millions of series because you can spread it over a um, large number of, re of uh, distinct resources that s basically handle subparts of the um, space. And so, yeah, and you can also use template aggregation rules to basically apply to many distinct metric names. You don't need to write a rule every single time um, you want to do aggregation. Um, and this was just a single metric, you know, and if you remove and just look at one service, there's only 3,000 unique time series here. Um, very doable to scale up and look at those metrics on the fly or as alerts. Um, but if you want to learn more, um, our session's at 3.25 p.m. today. Uh, thank you so much for having me here. It's, it's, been, uh, it's been great to be back in person. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you. And I know I have a couple questions, but that'll probably come for the session later.